Hey, welcome to Fountain City Church's weekly sermon. Our mission is to multiply families of missional disciples locally and globally, and we hope the message has inspired you to do just that. If you live in the Chattahoochee Valley and you don't have a church home, we would love to invite you to come and join us. Thanks so much for watching. Okay. You guys doing all right this morning? Why don't we, uh, can you guys just give it up for the worship team? I don't know if you guys know this or not, but um, um, service starts at 10, and our worship team gets here at like 7.30, 7.45. They all wake up at like 6 or something in the morning, you know, to get here on time. A lot of preparation goes into what we do up here, and I just really want to make sure like we're just giving them honor. Like they're just so faithful and awesome to be here on time, and let's just give it up for them again. <clears throat> hey Amen. I'm multitasking because my iPad's at 10%. <laughs> so we're just going to see what happens. <laughs> so my name is Daniel Miller. I'm on staff here as the worship pastor, church planner in residence. Uh, you just heard from our lead pastor, Grant Collins. Um, and coming off, um, Easter Sunday, we were actually planning on getting into the book of James, um, getting back to the book of James. As you guys know, we've been doing a, um, we've been doing a series, y'all, technical difficulties. Nope. Boom. Um, we've been, <laughs> so we've been kind of going back and forth from the book of James. And as, after Easter, we had plans to get back into the book of James. But as Pastor Grant last week was preparing uh, that sermon, he just kind of felt a check to go back and let's talk about um, that in between, like uh, I've been kind of thinking of it as the aftermath of the crucifixion. Like, what was it like that those moments, those days between his death and his resurrection, what was it like to be a disciple in that in-between moment? And then, almost more importantly, what was it like to finally, after probably, it was just three days, but for them it probably felt like three years, to finally encounter the resurrected Christ? So uh, last week we talked about Thomas and his story and how he processed those moments. This week we're going to talk about a couple other groups, different groups of uh, disciples uh, and how they were dealing with the aftermath of Jesus' death. Um, and if you will, if you just turn in your Bibles with me to uh, Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, man, worship was just incredible. I came in a little late. I came in like in the middle of the first song. And I'm telling y'all don't tell Andy and Brandon. No offense, but there's just something about not having drums. You come in here and everybody's just singing so loud. And maybe y'all sing just as loud with the drums, but you just can't tell. But it's just like I, I say it every time. There's just something magical that happens, you know, when it's like those the voices just let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Woo! Come on, man. All right, so Luke uh, 24, uh, I'm just going to pray. Lord, give us eyes to see. Lord, give us ears to hear. May we just feel your presence this morning as we come into your word. Uh, Lord, be with me. Bless the speaker. Open my ears that I may hear what you're saying that I may be obedient to speak those words back to your people. Be with us this morning, Lord. We make space for you to come, to speak to us, Lord. There is nothing like your presence, and it is the only thing, your nearness, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Amen. So we're in Luke chapter 24. Um, so what's happening here? So Jesus, he dies on the cross. Um, and uh, his disciples, so they're processing, they're all in their own ways, they're processing that disappointment, right? Um, 
And here in, in verse 13, we, uh, we come across two disciples that are walking down the road to Emmaus. How many of you guys have heard this story before? Probably many of you, right? So let's read it. So verse 13, Now that same day two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, so what things? So the crucifixion of Christ, right? That's what they're talking about. So they're like discussing that moment. Um, so as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Verse 16. But they were kept from recognizing him. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? <laughs> they stood still, their face downcast. I like the NASB. It says they stood still looking sad. It's just a little bit more blunt and clear. They stood still looking sad. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? <laughs> He's like looking at Jesus like, how do you not know what's going on? And Jesus asked him a question and he already knows, knows the answer. Don't you love when the Lord just asks you a question and he already knows the answer? He says, what things? <laughs> what things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they, they replied. He was a prophet Powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. So, man, there's a lot happening here. Um, I'm just going to unpack some of it. So we have two followers of Jesus. So the Bible, we, when, usually when we think of the, the disciples of Jesus, we think of the twelve, right? But the Bible uses the term disciple, and it, it uses that term very broadly to really just speak of anybody who is following Jesus. So like when he sends out the 72, there's 72 people who are referred to as disciples. So these two disciples who were following Jesus, who called him Lord, Master, probably seen him multiple times. In fact, the Bible actually tells us that the wife of uh, Cleopas, or however you pronounce that, was there at the cross during the crucifixion. And she's probably the other person here with Cleopas. It's probably husband and wife. So it's not that they only just heard about Jesus, but they never seen him, and so they didn't recognize him. But they, they actually, this was their Lord and Master, who they've been with, who they've been familiar with. And now all of a sudden, they don't even recognize him standing right in front of him, in front of them. Verse 16 says, they were kept from recognizing him. <clears throat> and I believe that it was their disappointment that blinded them. I believe that it was their discouragement and disappointment that kept them from recognizing their Lord and Master who was standing right there. And here they are having an encounter with the resurrected Christ and they can't even realize that it's Him. They lost total sight of who He was. Now I ask you today, have you ever been there before? I know I have. Blinded by disappointment. Totally numb to God and His presence. Let down. Deaf to His voice. Cold hearted to His people. Bitter with His church. Angry with His bride. So disappointed by prayers that I think are unanswered. God, are you the healer? Because I asked you to heal my friend and that didn't happen. So now I'm stuck here empty-handed 
wondering who you are. Are you the provider? How about all these prophetic words that I got? Telling me I'm supposed to do this or be this or do this thing. Or go here or say this. And now I'm standing here empty handed. And I imagine that as these guys walked down this road, their conversation sounded a lot like that. Hopeless, full of questions, anger, bitterness, despair. Everything these guys had hoped in and believed in since they were children. Their Messiah had went and died on a cross. Like, I, don't, I, I just don't think it's really even possible for us to really understand the weight of that. Um, I really don't. And, and as these guys were walking and discussing these, their broken hearts, Jesus appears right in front of them, and they miss Him. And see, verse 21 says, We had hoped that He was the one who was going to redeem Israel. See, this verse sheds a little bit more light on what's going on in these guys' hearts. See, they weren't just disappointed that Jesus died. And it's actually much deeper than that. They were disappointed because all of their expectations of Jesus and who they thought He was and what they thought He was going to do, all those expectations died along with Him. See, it wasn't just their master and teacher that died. All the expectations of who Jesus was And see, I believe that for most of us, we come to faith and without even realizing it, we bring all these expectations along the way. I get Jesus and all my problems go away. And we forget that this thing cost us our very lives. Like Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must pick up their cross and follow me. He who wants to find their life will lose it. But whoever loses it for my sake will find it. And sometimes, this is what I believe, sometimes our expectations of Jesus, of who He is and what He's going to do, I believe that those things must first die in order for us to see Him rightly. Sometimes we have to let our ideas of what Christianity is be put to death so we can really actually start following Him. And here's the beautiful part, okay? Jesus is actually better than your expectations. He's better. He's better. It's not, it's not a letdown to find out that all your expectations have to die because He has something else in store. No, it's actually way better. It's way better. Did Jesus die? Yes. But He didn't stay dead. Did their expectations die? Yes. But everything they thought He was going to do, He was still going to do it. Just not the way they thought and not how they expected. They thought He was coming to save Israel, but in reality, He was coming to save the world. They thought... He was coming to conquer their enemies, but in reality, He was coming to conquer death, hell, and the grave, and sin for all eternity. And so these things that they were looking forward to were just like minuscule compared to like what He was actually planning on doing. And see, that's the thing about Jesus. He's just far better than our expectations. He's far better than anything we could ask, hope for, or imagine. And in our pain, in our suffering, in our disappointment, He's standing right there. In all your prayers that you think go unheard or unanswered, He's there. When your expectations of Jesus and this walk, this journey with Him, when all those expectations crumble... Jesus is there. Jesus is there. The true Jesus. And my question this morning is, do you have eyes to see Him? And if you don't, how can our eyes be open to see Jesus standing right in front of us in the midst of our disappointment? 
So let's look back at the beginning of Luke 24. Um, These two disciples on the road to Emmaus, if you remember, they referenced these women. Um, So let's look at uh, these ladies and their experience. Uh, So in Luke 24, verse 1, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, uh, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Uh, Now I'm going to insert a different account of this same moment from the book of Matthew. So in Matthew 28, this is the same moment just uh, from a different perspective. So verse 5, Matthew 28, verse 5. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy. I love that. Afraid yet filled with joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So let's look back at the beginning. These ladies had this encounter with Jesus Okay, and unlike these two other disciples, these ladies actually had eyes to see. So on that first, in that first verse, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared. So Jews didn't practice embalming, right, which was like this way, you know, uh, preserving the body, you know, uh, keep it from, you know, uh, producing like unpleasant odors, you know, all this kind of stuff. Jesus, uh, Jews didn't practice that. And instead, what they did was uh, they would take spices and perfumes and go and anoint a corpse to keep it from stinking. So which tells us these women did not anticipate a resurrection. You guys follow me? They're bringing spices to keep Jesus' corpse from producing unpleasant odors while it's rotting. Okay, so here they are, fully embracing the death of Jesus. Defeated, discouraged, disappointed, and yet still devoted. Out of their own love and care for Jesus and who He was and what He meant to them, they came to care for His corpse. Despite their disappointment in His death, They maintained a passionate devotion that led them to an empty tomb. Their devotion in the middle of disappointment led them to the place of resurrection. And see, here's the deal. They weren't, I I imagine that these ladies coming and doing this act, not anticipating a resurrection, at least not literally, they weren't filled with optimism or hope. Or encouragement. There was no like fake it till you make it. Smile and pretend like everything's okay. No, they were coming full of tears, emotion, to anoint the lifeless corpse of Christ. The corpse that represented all their hopes and dreams. They put on no front. They fully embraced mourning but maintained devotion. Devotion. I love that word. Devotion means love, loyalty, or enthusiasm for a person, activity, or cause. And I think, if if I can just be a little pushy this morning, I think if you want me to be honest, a lot of our times is that we just don't love Him. We just don't love Jesus. Are you really in love with Jesus? I think so many times we buy into the idea of Christianity, but not the person of Christ. 
Eternal life. Sign me up. Spiritual gifts? Yes, baby. Yes. More. But what about Jesus? What about the Jewish man that died on a cross? What about the carpenter that knelt down in the sand? Drew something with his finger as the religious leaders were preparing stones. What about him? Do you love him? Are you devoted to him? And see, if I'm honest with you, like that took me a while. And that, that, that was something that kind of like had to be built within me. I, I encountered the Holy Spirit many years ago and I fell in love with Him. But over the course of several years, Him and I built this relationship. And it took years for me to actually uh, be fully devoted to Him and fall in love with His presence. And be so, um, and, and I'm, it's still something that's it's still a process for me, right? You know, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, I'm there, but it's this thing that's developed. It's this thing that we build. And see, devotion says, I'm not actually in this thing for me, I'm in it for Him. Jesus is my prize, He's the one that I want. Now, there's no shame in coming to Jesus in need. It happens all the time. And we look at the life of Christ and it happened all the time. People came needing a miracle, needing a healing, whatever. And he never once rebuked anyone for that. But when you come to Jesus in need, it's an invitation to remain following him in devotion. Does that make sense? Okay. Despite the disappointment of his death, these women let the love, devotion, and loyalty lead them to a place of resurrection where they realized Jesus wasn't dead anymore. And see, I don't want to create this thing where it's like you just got to work harder. Like Jesus isn't like this abusive spouse. You don't love me enough. You know, that's not the point, but I really don't know how to say it any differently You really got to love him. The man, Jesus. Jesus must be your prize. Your satisfaction must be found in him. Not the gifts or the anointing or the power, the calling or the purpose or the destiny. He alone must be your one thing. And everything else will get tested and tried. Everything else will get tested. Through fire. And what's left will be you and Him. And the question is, is that enough for you? Everything I've, I've, I've pursued, even things that looked like Jesus, have been tested. Pursuing church, tested. Pursuing ministry, tested. Pursuing, you know, uh, spiritual leaders, tested. Pursuing revival, Tested. You say, well, those things are the same thing, Jesus and revival. They are. Jesus is the person of revival, but sometimes we create these ideas of what these things ought to look like. And when we create these ideas of what ministry should look like, or revival should look like, or what church should look like, we miss the person of Jesus, and we miss those things because we're looking for what we think they should look like. And we've grown blind to them. And so you could pursue church, or you could pursue revival, you could pursue the idea of ministry, the idea of church, the idea of revival, and not be pursuing the person of revival, who is Jesus. And I don't want to, like, okay, so... If your pursuit is really Jesus, if, if your devotion is in Christ and Christ alone, it's not that you're immune to disappointment, but it's that that's the place where um, sorrow and weeping only last a night and joy comes in the morning. Like when you're really, when your pursuit is in Christ and Christ alone, you'll always get what you're chasing after. You guys hear me? When you're chasing Jesus, you'll never be left empty-handed. Ever. When your pursuit is Christ 
is the man, Christ. You'll never be left empty-handed. Okay. <clears throat> I believe it was in that posture that these women came to anoint his body, which ultimately led them to an encounter with the resurrected Jesus where they had eyes to see him. And our eyes are open to Jesus, to the resurrected Jesus, when our devotion is found in him and him alone. Amen? Okay, so devotion. Let's look back in uh, Luke chapter 24 and verse 6. It says, He is not here. He has risen. Remember how He told you while He was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. In verse 8 says, Then they remembered His words. Then they remembered His words. <clears throat> I believe it's so important that in seasons of pain and heartache, we remind ourselves of the promises of God, the Word of God, and the testimonies of God. Now, if you're anything like me, you may have a bad memory. I've got a terrible memory. and I hate to say that, but it's just true. My iPad died. So now my memory is going to get tested. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I'll use my phone. It's fine. <clears throat> um, so verse 26, uh, or excuse me, so in John, I think it's John 14, uh, in John 14, verse 26, Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all the things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So it's actually the job of the Holy Spirit within you that brings to remembrance the promises of God, the Scripture, the testimony of God. So can you partner with the Holy Spirit to remind yourself of His good deeds, of His words and His promises in, trials of, or in times of trials and suffering? See, whenever I feel like God isn't speaking, I must remind myself of the last time He spoke. Whenever I feel like God isn't moving, I must feast on the memories of the last time He did move. And maybe you received a prophetic word from a trusted source or you had a, a dream that you know is from God. We must lean on those words. Write those things down. Scripture tells us that we overcome by the word of our testimony. Testimonies or stories of God, of His faithfulness, of His goodness, have the power to bring you out of the pit and give you eyes to see Him. And ultimately, we must remind ourselves of the promises and of the foundations that are laid within Scripture. What does the Bible say about what I'm going through? What does Scripture say of who God is? So, uh, quite a few years ago, I, I had a friend um, named Thomas, and um, we found out that Thomas got cancer, and by the time the doctors found it, um, it was everywhere, and we prayed, we prayed, we prayed, we laid hands on him. And in the end, uh, Thomas passed away. And, um, you know, it's in times like that where it's just so easy to go back to the drawing board. To rewrite your theology. Maybe, maybe God isn't really the healer. Maybe the scripture doesn't mean what it says when it says, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Maybe by his stripes we aren't really healed. So maybe I just won't pray for people anymore. Maybe I just won't lay hands on the sick anymore. And we create th theology and we go back to the drawing board and we, re we, 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 
We rewrite what we think about God and who He is based on our circumstances to make our circumstances make more sense. And see, I can't change who God is to make everything make more logical sense. That's just not how it works. I must remember Scripture. I must remember what the Bible says about Him and what the Bible tells me to do. I don't know why everybody doesn't get healed. I don't know why some people get healed and others don't. I don't. But I know the Bible tells me to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I know the Bible says in James 5 that the prayer, a faithful prayer lifted up will heal the sick. And so that's what I'll do. That's what I'm going to do. I know the Bible says that God is Jehovah Rapha, the healer. That's who he is. And so I will continue to lay hands. I will continue. You show me one person with cancer, I'll be the first one there to pray. And see, we can't give up and change our pursuit based on our experiences. I believe we can build, I believe it's okay to like build, you know, theology and, and what we think about God based on our own experiences. But do those things line up with Scripture and what uh, Scripture says about God? Do they line up with testimonies of the past? See, I was in Brazil. And this kid had thick glasses, thick like I mean, he must have been like legally blind. He's in the back of the room. And he comes to me and he wants me to pray that his vision gets, you know, normal. And that he can see without his glasses. And I'm praying for him in the back of the room. And we pray and we pray and we, you know, he takes his glasses off and it doesn't get any better. He puts them back on. You know, we pray, we pray, we pray, pray. You know, here I am with glasses praying for this kid with glasses on, you know. Finally, I'm like, okay, take him off. He takes his glasses, glasses off, excuse me. And he starts reading the words on the screen from across the room where he could not before. And we just start weeping. And it's those stories that I must feast on in the middle of circumstances like my friend Thomas who passed away from cancer. You guys follow me? Okay. Oh, man, oh, man. And I'll say this. I'll just push it a little bit further. I think sometimes it's not always enough to just remember his words or scripture or testimonies. But we also have to trust those things as well. And see... Uh, I said it a few weeks ago, faith will move a mountain, but trust will get you through the valley. And see, faith is given, but trust is built. And so trust comes through relationship. <clears throat> and so it's, it's one thing to remember that God is provider, but it's another thing entirely when bills are due and you're up short to trust. He's got it. He's got it. And see, I, we're creatures of logic and reason. It's just human nature to need to know why. Right? It's like the question, it's like the question, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's the question at the center of every question we have. Why are we here? What's our purpose? You know, why do, why do I get up every day and go to work? Why do some people get healed and others don't? Why does God provide for other people's? Why did this person get a check in the mail and I didn't? You know, whatever. <clears throat> but faith and trust invite us to places that go past that human nature, that need for logic and reasoning. When I don't understand, God is inviting me into surrender and mystery. And that is trust. You say that just sounds like blind faith. Well, I don't, you know, you can call it what you want. Okay. But he promised to give a peace that passes understanding. Meaning there's a level of peace that I can only attain if I'm willing to surrender my right to understand. <laughs> 
it means that what he has for me is actually far better than my ability to understand what's going on. And he has a peace for me that will surpass and trump any level of understanding that I can attain on my own. I see, Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Okay. Amen? I'm going to confess something before I move into my last point. You know, this, feel, this word feels a little heavy, and as I was preparing it, I kind of felt that. And even last week, you know, what we were talking about. But I believe, like I was sharing as I was going into it, you know, we were, we were planning on getting back into James. And, and I, I believe that what we're talking about last week, this week, and next week is like this prophetic thing. We were talking about the sermon, uh, the sermon about Thomas last week in our in our home group, and just listening to what um, our our people, you know, were saying about it, what what they're going through, and the questions they're asking. Um, before I get into this last point, I really just want to pray that the Lord will just meet us where we're at. And I really just want to create space for him to meet us in this word and what he's sharing with our body. If we look back at Luke chapter 24, uh, these two disciples on the road to Emmaus, we're going to pick back up where we left off earlier. Uh, So they're walking down the road, right? They meet Jesus. They don't recognize him. So they're walking down the road. They start talking with him. Jesus starts telling them scripture. He kind of rebukes them. He's like, didn't I tell you this was going to happen? Didn't the prophet say this was going to happen? You know? And so in verse 28, let's see if I can get my phone acting right. Okay. Okay. Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened. And they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? This this part of the passage reminds me a lot of my favorite verse in the Bible, which is Revelation 3.20. And it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in with I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And see, I don't this is just my opinion. I don't believe that these disciples invited Jesus into their home just, you know, out of the kindness of their own hearts. Or, you know, just being, you know, the good Samaritans, right? I believe that it's much deeper than that. I think deep within them, they felt that knock that Revelation 3.20 talks about. I think deep within them, even when they couldn't recognize Jesus, they, they felt their hearts burning. Their spirits were crying out. The deep was calling out. And they urged him strongly to stay. They created a place for Jesus to come in and rest. In the midst of their disappointment, these guys were sensitive and they created space for Jesus to come and rest. Behold, he stands at the door 
to your heart. And he comes in and he breaks the bread. And it was in that moment when he broke the bread that they realized it was him. And if you look back in Luke 22, at the Last Supper, he says, at the Last Supper, he's telling the twelve, he says, he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I believe that what happens with these disciples on the road to Emmaus or in their homes is when Jesus broke his bread, broke that bread, it was like the lights came on. Like almost like a pop. Boom. And then all of a sudden they remembered Christ. They remembered Jesus. They remembered the cross. They remembered that he said that he was going to die. And three days later he'd rise again. They remembered and they saw. They had eyes to see. And I believe that what this means for us is that in times of disappointment, there's this invitation to return to the simple gospel of Christ, Christ crucified, that everything else can just fall away. Nothing else matters. But Christ and Christ crucified. We return to the table that we make space in our own lives and our own hearts in pain, in disappointment, when we're angry at God. My mother-in-law Sandy said something that I just thought was so powerful last Thursday as we were talking about Thomas. She said, can you forgive God? And I, I think that might sound offensive to some people because it's like, well, God does no wrong. But you can be bitter towards somebody that didn't do anything wrong. You can be hurt towards somebody that didn't do anything wrong. And the power is in your hands to let that person go. And sometimes I think we hold God's feet to the fire. But can you forgive him? Create a space for him to come in, in your pain, in your disappointment, in your anger, in your bitterness, in your questions, in your, in your lack of understanding, in your wondering, in the mystery. In the midst of all the prayers that you feel go unheard or unanswered, can you create a space that says, you and you alone, Jesus, I just want to be devoted to you. Come into me, Lord. Here, O oh Lord, have I made a place for you to rest. Will you come in? Remind me of your broken body. Remind me of your blood poured out for this moment. For this moment, for, the, for my sins. But like Hannah told me the other day, Jesus, he didn't just die for your sins. He died for the sins that were committed against you. Remind me of how you forgive not just me, but those who've hurt me. Those who've caused me pain in my disappointment, in my anger, with my fist raised to the sky. Remind me of the cross. Here, O oh Lord, have I made, prepared a place for you to come and dwell. Here, O oh Lord. Here, O oh Lord. Why don't you guys just stand up with me? Hey, thanks again for listening to this week's sermon. If you felt like the Lord was speaking to you in a specific way, please reach out to us at info at We'd love to partner with you in your faith. Thanks again.